Moving on with why I'm not a fan of ketogenic diets. You can consider uh, anecdotes like this, renal stone associated with a ketogenic diet in a five-year-old girl with intractable epilepsy. I do think that there is something going on here and that um, there is a potential for a ketogenic diet to impair bone health. A short-term ketogenic diet impairs markers of bone health in response to exercise. And um, there is uh, potential for low-grade metabolic acidosis in ketogenic diets, potentially contributing to these renal stones, loss of calcium, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot going on here that could be negative. I don't think this is the optimal state for humans. Um, this article I find a sort of comical. I add it just as a, a bit of context. The prevalence of micronutrient deficiency in popular diets they compared Atkins for Life, which is essentially a ketogenic diet, South Beach, Beach diet, and the DASH diet. And I thought it was interesting that all of them <laughs> had significant micronutrient deficiencies. So some people would say, oh, a ketogenic diet has nutrient deficiencies. Well, guess what? <laughs> Every diet you look at is going to have micronutrient deficiencies. I'm sure if they had uh, a Mediterranean diet on here, they would find micronutrient deficiencies. I think this speaks to a broader issue, which is the fact that the way that we look at nutrients is flawed. And it is very interesting to try and reverse engineer a diet based on the nutrients we know humans need. And there's a lot to, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, the way we calculate nutrients is a little funny in some nutrients. Uh, the way that we look at them in foods, K1 versus K2 confusion, and the fact that we're not even considering bioavailability. Um, clearly, you guys are familiar with my work. You know that I think most of these plant nutrients are very poorly bioavailable. I'm not saying a ketogenic diet is necessarily nutrient poor. If you included organs on your ketogenic diet, it could be pretty nutrient rich, but uh, I think it's a topic for another podcast where we get our micronutrients from and trying to reverse uh, engineer a diet based on the nutrients we know humans need, I think is a fascinating rabbit hole to go down. Now, some people would say, well, Paul, we know ketogenic diets are better for weight loss. Not really. If you look at meta-analyses like this one, which I think is the most comprehensive one, although it was done in 2006, um, ketogenic diets were at least as effective as low fat energy restricted diets for up to one year. And anyone who says they're better, if you look at one year, they start to converge. So I'm not convinced that a ketogenic diet is going to lead to more weight loss than any other type of diet that is limiting calories. Um, the, although they say this is a non-energy restricted, uh, diet. So they're presuming some, uh, you caloric diets. Um, although they say these are non-energy restricted diets, they're at least as effective as low fat energy restricted diets, but at one year, uh, these do converge. And so, as I spoke about in the beginning of the podcast, I think the issue here is satiety and there's only so long you can suppress that ghrelin in a human, uh, before you end up with other problems from not having enough postprandial insulin signaling, things like hormonal changes, electrolyte changes, which can be quite severe. Uh, I think the way to fix weight loss, the way to fix weight loss, I cannot overemphasize this point. I cannot emphasize this point enough. The way to create weight loss is to improve food quality by eliminating seed oils because of the mechanisms I outlined earlier. Let's continue further down the rabbit hole of why I'm not a fan of ketogenic diets. Um, let's look at T3 and thyroid markers. This is something that happens to essentially everyone I've seen on a ketogenic diet, their T3 goes low. Their thyroid hormones get a little bit wonky. And though we're not entirely sure what this means, our, is receptor sensitivity changes? Is receptor sensitivity changing? Um, I just can't ignore this any longer. Isocaloric carbohydrate deprivation, ketogenic diet, induces protein catabolism. Not a good thing. Despite a low T3 syndrome in healthy men, you don't want a low T3, guys. T3 is linked to metabolism. T3 is linked to basal metabolic rate. T3 is linked to your hormones. And according to this study, you're getting uh, protein catabolism, loss of muscle, but they are noting that there is decreased T3 syndrome in humans when you restrict ketogenic, when you restrict carbohydrates on a ketogenic diet. I am, this is just clearly demonstrated over and over and over in the research. And anyone who's done this, if you look at their thyroid labs, you will see that they are they're out of whack. Their T3 is low. These resolved and improved uh, for me significantly. You can see my blood work podcast from last week when I included carbohydrates back in my diet. Now, my TSH was never off, which is why it's like a eucaloric sick syndrome, something we don't really fully understand in medicine. 
The body doesn't want to push the TSH too high, perhaps because it thinks you're starving. It doesn't want the metabolic rate to go too high because it thinks you're searching for food, but there's something different about restricting carbohydrates in the thyroid and it doesn't look good. That was probably why I was always a little cold in San Diego. Got better when I moved to other places that were much colder at certain times of the year, like Texas. Um, but my thyroid hormones improved. So uh, this is an interesting one. The influence of dietary carbohydrate intake on the free testosterone to cortisol ratio responses to short-term intensive exercise training. This is a 2010 paper. Basically what it shows is that when you give carbohydrates, the changes in post-exercise free testosterone to cortisol look way better. The findings suggest that if the free testosterone to cortisol ratio is utilized as a marker of training stress or imbalance, it is necessary for a moderately high diet of carbohydrate to be consumed to maintain validity of any observed changes in the ratio value because that ratio changes significantly in a negative way when the low carbohydrate uh, diets were tried. So, what they're saying here is that on a low carbohydrate diet, at least in this study, Short-term intensive exercise training resulted in more decline in testosterone, more increase in cortisol. I wish people would use this ratio more, this testosterone, free testosterone to cortisol ratio. I don't really care what your testosterone is if your cortisol is through the roof too, which is overtraining. But in the past, I believe in some Olympic camps and places, they have used this free testosterone to cortisol ratio to tell people when they were ready to continue training. I wish it were something that were easier to check on us. Imagine if there were a uh, like a continuous glucose monitor, uh, you could get a free testosterone to cortisol monitor that you put on your on your sleeve, and you could tell, oh, I'm overtrained, my cor cortisol is going up, my free testosterone is going down. But what that study shows is that when you give people carbohydrates, their free testosterone to cortisol ratio changes uh, less badly. It actually doesn't change much; doesn't have much of a negative change at all in that case. And if you want to see what my uh, blood glucose responses were to a uh, carbohydrate containing diet. I've done multiple podcasts with Kara from NutriSense and shared my continuous glucose monitor readings. So this one is also fascinating. Modification of immune responses to exercise by carbohydrates, glutamine, and antioxidant supplements. It's along the same lines, consuming carbohydrate, but not glutamine or other amino acids during exercise, it attenuated the rise, which means it put a, a ceiling on the rise in stress hormones, such as cortisol. And it appears to limit the degree of exercise-induced immunosuppression, at least for non-fatiguing bouts of exercise. Evidence that high doses of antioxidant vitamins can prevent exercise-induced immunosuppression is also lacking. Whole separate discussion. Having more carbohydrates in your diet, especially consuming them during exercise, resulted in an improvement in stress hormones after exercise. I think it's hard for anyone to argue that carbohydrates don't have a benefit in situations like this. These are the benefits of carbohydrates. You don't want post-exercise immune suppression. You don't want post-exercise huge spikes in cortisol. This will limit your progress long-term. Having carbohydrates helps with this. I didn't always understand these results, but this has been part of my journey going down the rabbit hole as I lost my religion of ketosis over the last few years. It's not to say that I don't appreciate some benefits to ketosis and how it helps us understand the molecular mechanisms of obesity, satiety, and uh, nutritional uh, paradigms I, that are ideal for humans in general, but I don't think it's ideal for humans at all. One more study that I wanna talk about here is quite fascinating, the effects of diets high in protein or carbohydrate on inflammatory markers in overweight subjects. So what you find here is that the dietary carbohydrate protein ratio had no effect on inflammatory markers. Body fatness is positively associated with levels of serum CRP, but you can limit carbohydrates or you can limit um, protein. And there were no differences in inflammatory markers, meaning that carbohydrates don't appear to be inflammatory in humans, especially when you're trying to lose weight. This is a study with 50 overweight subjects randomly assigned to ad libitum, either fat-reduced diet, high in protein and low in carbohydrates, or a high-carbohydrate, low in protein diet during six months of strictly controlled dieting. There were no changes in the inflammatory markers. Carbohydrates are not inflammatory. Now, 
that study didn't even really control for the quality of carbohydrates. They weren't just using what I might consider to be the best quote unquote sources of carbohydrates. They were only using probably standard carbohydrates, grains and things like that. And it still didn't show any differences there. So anyone saying that carbohydrates are inflammatory, I've yet to see evidence for that unless they're doing a little bit of hand-waving and nutritional reductionism. There's one more study that I want to show that I found pretty interesting, testosterone and cortisol in relationship to dietary nutrients and resistance exercise. The R values for some of these graphs are not incredibly impressive, but uh, look at the serum testosterone and the percent energy in the diet by fat. Okay. As you go from 7.5, which is very low fat diet to 30% fat, that's a reasonable amount of fat to have in the diet, probably close to what I have. Testosterone goes up. The R squared value is 0.51. Okay. Saturated fat, pretty clear. R squared is 0.59. The more saturated fat you have per day, the more your testosterone goes up. The more monounsaturated fat you have per day, okay, more testosterone goes up. All right. We don't necessarily hate monounsaturated fat. I just like saturated fat more. R squared is 0.62. But look here, polyunsaturated fat to saturated fat ratio, as the amount of polyunsaturated fat increases, right? You get a bigger number here. Serum testosterone goes down. The R squared is 0.39, so not as good as some of these others. But then look at the percent energy in protein, right? As you get to super high levels of percent energy from protein, the serum testosterone goes down. And then the protein and carbohydrate ratio is quite fascinating to me. Again, this is a fraction. So more carbohydrate is more in the denominator, which means this number is going to be smaller. Serum testosterone goes up as there's more carbohydrate and less protein in the diet. That is a R squared of 0.35. So the fit is not great, but those are some interesting trends to consider from a lab that is a fan of ketogenic diets, that being Jeff Volek's lab.